Marius de Romanus. A 2,000 year old, extremely powerful, ancient vampire and self-proclaimed member of the Children of the Millennia. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. From the opening statement you'll already be aware that today's topic will be from Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles and in particular the ancient Roman vampire Marius de Romanus. What a tale this character has, what a journey he's had, many journeys, hundreds of journeys journeys. In preparation for his story, I've taken information about Marius' life from several of Anne's books such as The Vampire Lestat, The Queen of the Damned, The Vampire Armand and mostly Blood and Gold which is Marius' own account of his life. Guys the research for today's video was so heavily detailed that I honestly think I need a break from reading. Basically what I'm saying is if you appreciate this video and you appreciate the beauty of just reading a book then please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, it really means the world and it goes a long way. Anyway, let's continue the video. Marius for me is just a character that seems to have an answer for everything. Obviously that stands down to 2000 years of experience, 2000 years of wit and wisdom and in my opinion that means such wisdom would be close to being unquestionable. However Marius had a beginning like all other vampires. We've had to wait a while to get it, the biggest taste was his role in the vampire Armand, but when Blood and Gold was finally written and released, we got to discover Marius as a person, we got to see who Marius truly was and everything that shaped him into the all powerful, all wise vampire he is in recent times. I enjoyed Blood and Gold, I thought it was a good read. I do believe however that Anne goes into a little too much detail on things that just aren't relevant to Marius. Talking too much about what was happening in current events like the changing of emperors, the growth of Christianity. You know I do feel it's okay to hear about these things but just not for 3 pages long. Anyway what Anne does do is tell a marvellous origin story of a vampire that's been a mainstay in so many of her previous writings. Excluding Akasha and Enkil as they aren't exactly active vampires, Marius is the oldest vampire in existence next to Maharet and Makar. But in terms of power, after drinking so much of Akasha's blood, he is top of the food chain. Speaking of Akasha, Marius worshipped her as if she was truly his queen. And despite how events played out in the Queen of the Damned, for millennia both he and Akasha did have a good relationship. Marius was born in 30 BC and was a citizen of the Roman Gallic city of Messia. His mother was a Celtic woman from the city of Gaul and his father a wealthy Roman. He was a scholar and a chronicler, meaning he wrote and recorded his own accounts of important historical information and rather enjoyed doing so. He also loved to travel and visited all the great European cities. Marius was 25 when he met a young 10 year old girl by the name of Lydia, later known as Pandora, whom he wished to marry, but was denied so by her father due to her very young age. It was common in those times to court a woman when they were relatively young, marrying them when they came of age and maturity, but Lydia's father did not see it that way. Marius spent the next 15 years travelling and studying in great detail, becoming incredibly educated, gaining knowledge and great wisdom. He really was a marvellous human. Marius was at work on a chronicle of world history when a druid abducted him. The druid priest Mal forced Marius to learn the druid language and customs. On the night of the great feast of Saun, the druids took Marius to the giant oak tree where they had imprisoned their other god. Because he was an extraordinary human being, the druids wanted him to replace the god of the grove, a burned and crippled vampire who no longer inspired their ceremonies. After being made a vampire, Marius broke free of the druids and pursued his new course. He travels to Alexandria and encounters other burned vampires. One of them took him to the Elder, a vampire who told Marius about Akasha and Enkil, the original vampires. Marius learned that he, like other vampires, is vitally connected to them and that if they suffered harm, he and all other vampires would experience similar damage. Since they had been placed in the sun, as a consequence, vampires everywhere had been burned or destroyed. 
The recognition that whatever happens to them happens to him upsets him greatly, although it affirmed Marius' desire for an existence of a continuous awareness. Akasha asked Marius to take her and Elkil out of Egypt before the Elder, the one who had deliberately placed them in the sun, destroyed them. Marius took them as requested, taking them back to Antioch first. While there, he finds his love, Lydia, now known as Pandora, and makes her into a vampire when her life is threatened. Pandora believes that Akasha had willed their union and she and Marius were deeply in love, living together for 200 years in Antioch, bringing flowers and singing hymns to Enkil and Akasha. Unfortunately, the two ended up parting ways on extremely bad terms, due to Marius losing hope in the possibility of a fortuitous future for vampires, after he and Pandora slaughtered a group of Delists who believed that the devil was their maker and their god. He knew the truth, that all vampires stemmed from the great queen Akasha herself, but they didn't. Nobody did. Marius speaks of the parting when he says, Why am I not with her now, you may ask? What is it in me that will not acknowledge her mind, her beauty, her exquisite understanding of all things? Why can't I go to her? I don't know. I know only that a terrible anger and pain divides us just as it did so many years ago. I cannot admit how much I have wronged her. I abandoned my Pandora. Marius moved back to Rome with Akasha and Enkil but truly missed Pandora. He was incredibly lonely and it was out of that loneliness that he began feeding on four, sometimes five victims a night, more than he craved, more than he needed. Sometimes he just left the bodies in the street not caring about the consequence. He loved to kill in taverns as it brought with it an excitement. He loved the atmosphere of the tavern, the warmth, the singing, it was all satisfactory. It was during this time in Rome when Marius encountered two vampires, Maul and Avicus. Maul of which he remembers vividly and with distaste. He was initially angered as he states in chapter 5, this was Maul. The druid priest who had long ago captured me and taken me prisoner, and fed me alive to the burnt and dying god of the grove. This was Maul who had kept me in captivity for months as he prepared me for the dark magic. This was Maul, the pure of heart and the fearless one who I had come to know so very well. Marius immediately knew he was much more powerful than him and could easily destroy him if he wished. They had a strongly worded conversation about what happened in the past, with Maul accusing Marius of abandonment and corruption. Marius befriends Avicus, and the three live together in the same area without disturbing one another, until Maul senses the power of Akasha and Enkil, and demands to see them. Marius obliges. The hostility between Maul and Marius seem to have dispersed in addition to much encouragement from Avicus to put the past to rest. They lived together for some time, but with so many invasions and wars happening, Marius grew tired with the current state of affairs. He lost interest in his life in general, and slept for over 100 years as Maul and Avicus watched over him. After he woke, Marius tells of how he, Avicus and Maul worked together to strengthen their powers in order to unlock the many gifts available for their kind and also of their encounter with the Greek vampire Eudoxia, who wanted to take Akasha and then kill for herself after the Great Mother had let Eudoxia drink from her. Marius knew he would have to fight her to the death in order to rid himself of her threat. However, after Marius asked Akasha if she wanted to be taken by Eudoxia, Akasha responded by trying to kill the Greek vampire right before Marius' eyes. Marius pleads for Akasha to stop and pulls Eudoxia free, but when the vampire orders her slaves to bring her a victim to feed on in order to regain her strength, Marius immediately questions why they chose a rich merchant, whose death would draw attention, and draw attention it did. The merchant's death resulted in a riot and the sacking of Marius' home, which in turn caused Marius to lose all his personal belongings. Maul, Avicus, and Marius all came to the conclusion that Eudoxia must have purposely arranged this in order to bring risk to those who must be kept being discovered. 
Mary is immensely stronger than her, drags the vampire back before Akasha and watches as the queen devours her. After the ordeal, Mary is believing it's safer and wiser for him to be left alone with the knowledge of those who must be kept's whereabouts decides to part ways. Mary is going on to state that he always thought Mal as nothing more than a barbarian but acknowledged the two vampires were genuinely hurt and upset at their friend's departure. Moving to Venice in the 15th century, he resides in his home and focuses on life as a painter and actually gains a notable reputation. There were even accounts of guests watching Marius as he painted and even cheering him on with every brushstroke he made. He became completely mesmerized with the Italian painter Boccacelli, unable to comprehend just how incredible the man's talent truly was. Marius even considered giving him the dark gift in order to preserve his talent for all time, but eventually decided against it. Marius was also becoming increasingly concerned that he was looking less and less human. He was extremely pale beyond normal reason. The veins were too far visible on his skin. His eyes were so piercing that they appeared completely unnatural. He was also far too strong to the point he didn't even realize just how much. While embracing life as a painter, Marius met a mortal woman by the name of Bianca and quickly became infatuated with who she was and everything she represented. He desired nothing more than to make her an immortal. During his time in Venice, Marius discovered a young boy named Andre after hearing his thoughts while traveling on the canal. Marius described his initial thoughts when he says, It was the voice of a child behind thick walls who on account of the recent cruelties done to him, he can't remember his native language or even his name. Yet in that forgotten language he prayed to be delivered from those who had cast him down. Marius bought the boy from the brothel owner and took him home. He renamed him Amadeo as his celestial beauty was so angelic that Marius could think of no other fitting name. I loved him instantly and impossibly, Marius said. Amadeo was given a rather comfortable and luxurious life by Marius. He was not denied anything of which could benefit him physically and mentally. Marius seen to it that he was properly educated in law, government, history and philosophy. As Marius could not bring himself to make Bianca immortal, he decided that Amadeo would be next to receive the dark gift, but he would first learn the ways of the scholar before he would be taught the ways of the blood. For two years, Amadeo resided with Marius before the boy's immaturity surfaced, when he became romantically involved with the English Lord Harlick and spends several days with him. He abruptly plans to abandon him, and Lord Harlick stabs him with a poison blade for his betrayal. This leaves Marius with no choice but to change Amadeo into a vampire a lot earlier than expected. Marius believed that the boy had not yet tasted a true mortal life and now immortality was being placed upon his soul. Marius and Amadeo's happiness is also short-lived when Santino's coven, who believe themselves to be devout followers of Satan, capture Amadeo and set Marius and his home aflame, punishing Marius for living among mortals and for Marius denying him the knowledge of vampire lore, vampire beginnings and knowledge on those who must be kept. Marius is badly injured to the point of near death and turns to Bianca for help. With Bianca's blessing, Marius makes her into a vampire. They manage to escape to Marius' secret shrine of those who must be kept in the mountains of northern Italy, where Marius spends years drinking from Akasha to restore his physical self. He recalls this as the most miserable time of his life. He even recalls how empty and powerless he felt at not having the strength to be even able to open the door to the shrine, not physically nor with the mind gift. Akasha herself had to do it for him. He had to rely heavily on Bianca for quite some time, something that frustrated Marius as he had spent over 1000 years in such a strong, prominent position of power. Now I've stated in previous videos how damaging fire is to vampires. Many vampires use fire to commit suicide. 
However, known vampires to survive such horrid fire attacks are in fact Lestat and Marius. They should not have survived but for Akasha's blood in their system. Therefore, healing from burns takes years, decades, even centuries for vampires as their bodies are not meant to ever heal from such an elemental attack. Marius did heal slowly but in healing he learned something about himself that 1500 years of experience did not teach him. Slow healing made him stronger than he was before he was burnt. Marius was likely the most powerful vampire in active existence. Despite his companionship with Bianca, they did have their quarrels, especially over Bianca's insistence on Marius taking responsibility for the attack on him and his home, something that infuriated him. Marius was so angry over the situation that he initially abandoned her, left her, but his torn soul brought him back to her. He could not repeat what he had done with Pandora. Their travels eventually brought them to Paris where Marius encountered his beloved Amadeo, lost to him so long ago and now known as Armand. Marius best describes his horror at discovering Amadeo's involvement with the Satan worshipping vampires when he says he was dressed in rags, his hair caked with filth and when he found his first victim he visited upon her a painful death which appalled me. For an hour or more my eyes followed him as he proceeded on, feeding on another hapless creature and then circling back to walk his way to the enormous cemetery. I was repelled. For years and years he had been one of them. His mind, his soul, his body belonged to those he ruled and nothing that I had taught him had given him the strength to fight them. He was not my Amadeo anymore. Marius left Paris that night, citing it was up to Amadeo to free himself from the grips of the coven. Marius and Bianca moved the shrine of Akasha and Enkil to Dresden. Unknown to Bianca, Marius' true purpose for moving to Dresden was because he heard rumours of a woman who he believed to be Pandora to be living there. It was actually Bianca who sensed and discovered Pandora but she is also in the company of her fledgling Arjun. Their meeting revitalizes the love Marius has for Pandora. He anxiously requests that Pandora leave with him and to rid herself of Arjun as he is also willing to leave his companion Bianca. But Pandora adamantly refuses despite confessing her love for Marius still exists. Bianca overhears this and is distraught by how easily Marius was willing to leave her. In response, Bianca then leaves Marius, who is left completely alone. For three days he begged her not to leave but her mind had been made up the moment Marius denied her importance to him over Pandora. Years later Marius comes across a letter left for him by Pandora telling him that despite her protests she secretly wanted to leave Arjun and be with Marius again. In her letter she sets a time and location for them to meet and run away together soon after their last encounter. However by then it's well past the time she scheduled for them to meet, over 50 years gone. Marius recounts a letter which reads as follows. My beloved Marius, it is almost dawn and I have only a few moments in which to write to you. As we have told you, our coach will leave within the hour, carrying us away and toward the eventual destination of Moscow. Marius, I want nothing more than to come to you now but I cannot do it. I cannot seek shelter in the same new house with the ancient ones but I beg you my beloved, please come to Moscow, please come and help me free myself from Arjun. Later you can judge me and condemn me. I need you Marius. I shall haunt the vicinity of the Tsar's palace and cathedral until you come. Marius, I know I ask of you that you make a great journey but please come. Whatever I have said of my love Arjun, I am a slave now to completely and I will be yours again. Pandora. Back on his private island in the Aegean, Marius hears the calling of a young vampire named Lestat. Lestat was no more than 10 years in the blood and Marius decided to answer his call. He introduced Lestat to the origins of the vampire race and then the physical meeting with the mother and the father followed. A meeting of which Marius was initially quite jealous at Akasha's reaction to Lestat but took it as a positive step that someone as recent as Lestat could have any effect on the Great Mother. 
Things took a turn for the worse when Marius was away one night. The lure of Akasha had Lestat drawn to her in her chamber. The two vampires drank from each other, a sign of intimacy between immortals. This in turn caused Enkil to rise up in anger and be but mere moments away from crushing Lestat's chest despite the Queen's screams at him not to. Marius arrived just in time to persuade Enkil to stop as he threatens to aid Akasha in separating herself from him forever. Enkil removed his foot and sat back on his throne. Marius sent Lestat away, back to New Orleans, where the young vampire came across a man known as Louis de Pont du Lac, which begins the events of Interview with the Vampire. You can find the full breakdown of the story from Louis and Lestat's point of views in my videos based on their entire lives. Marius moves those who must be kept again and is not heard of until 1984 when Akasha awakens and buries him in ice beneath his home, but not before he telepathically calls out to Lestat, warning him of the danger. Marius survives Akasha's slaughter of the immortals and once again comes in contact with his beloved Pandora and also Armand at Maharet's Sonoma compound as they prepare for their final encounter with Akasha. However, they go their separate ways after Akasha's death and Makar is proclaimed the new Queen of the Damned. I think Marius is one of the most intriguing characters from the Vampire Chronicles. I especially love that his development came from Anne Rice unknowingly needing to create more depth for her characters. I'll finish this video with a quote from Anne on the creation of Marius. I don't remember the first time Marius sprang into my mind. Maybe it was when Lestat said he wanted to know whether immortals had been made in Roman times, when it was more enlightened and sophisticated than the Dark Ages. So Marius evolved as a character who really had the wisdom of that ancient world, the cleverness, the wit, the perspective on the world that I feel a sophisticated Roman should have had. He may have been evolved from the force of Armand's image. I might have written Armand's story before I knew who Marius really was. And with that being said guys, that is all for today. Thank you so much and I'll see you all in the very next video.